Hello everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Donna and I'm part of the membership team here at IRSM. Before I hand over to your branch chair, Peter, I'm just going to run through a few things first. To begin with, you should see to the right of your screen a toolbar with various options. You will be on mute for the duration of the webinar. Feel free to ask any questions, make any comments using the question area, and we will take five to 10 minutes to respond to these at the end of the presentations. If you need any support using GoToWebinar, the I symbol will take you to the support site. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be placed on the RISM YouTube channel after the event. Okay, so that's enough for me. Peter, I'm now gonna hand over to you. Lovely. Uh, sorry, Donna, I'm having trouble getting my screen yeah. to show. Oh, there you go. Ah, right, okay. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to what is the 100th branch meeting of uh, the UAE branch of the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management. Your branch chair, Peter Hurley, with you here on the 8th of December. Uh, just give you a quick overview of what we have in store for you today. Um, <clears throat> I've got some introductions and branch updates to provide you with, and we'll also be, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll also be hearing from Philip Pearson about the new uh, memorandum of understanding that has just been. Uh, signed with the Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre. We're also having a presentation from Andrew Merrison, who's the group head of HSE with um, Darwin, Darwish bin Ahmed group, um, on the importance of temporary work controls in construction risk management. And we'll close as we always do with questions and answers and any other business. So without further ado, I'm delighted that we have reached this milestone um, and it's a great privilege to be chairing the 100th branch meeting, but I'd like to extend my gratitude to all of you as members and to all of those who've gone before us and whose footsteps we walk in now. And I hope that um, we can continue the good work that we've done in the branch and, uh, and continue to grow and look forward to our 150th and 200th branch meetings in the future. Um, I'll hand over shortly to Philip to discuss the MOU, but you will have seen on the WhatsApp groups and um, perhaps on other forums that we have signed an MOU with the Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre. And also um, some exciting news that has come through in the last couple of days is the new working hours, new working schedules um, in the UAE. So we're shifting now from a Sunday to Thursday working week to a Monday to Friday working week, the Friday being a half day. At the moment, this has been confirmed for governments and schools, and I'm expecting there to be further confirmation about the private sector in due course. But that shift will be taking place from the 1st of January next year. OK, so I'll now hand over to Philip, who will give some uh, further explanation about the MOU that's just been signed. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Peter. It's a, I'm delighted to uh, see you all today here today. Um, uh, I also picked up on the, those changes to the working hours, and it's quite interesting to see how that was going to be implemented. And so, thank you, Peter, for updating me on that one. That's um, it's a, quite a momentous change for everybody in in in, in the region. So, um, uh, really exciting um, to have a, a more of an aligned position as well with the rest with most of the rest of the year of the world. So it's um, fantastic. Um, I just really want to give you a bit of an update. You're all aware, uh, obviously, now that, that we, we signed uh, a week or so ago um, at, a, at a formal ceremony. I was very honoured uh, to sign it on behalf of RSM, um an MOU with the Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre. Um, this is an this is a, an MOU that's been uh, a good oh, good 18 months in in its development. Um, it's it's based on the back of the uh, the old agreement that we 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 had with Oshad, um, which had been something that's been going on since probably about 2014. We had our original agreement with Oshad, so this is just basically building on that because obviously Abu Dhabi Public Health Centres subsumes many of the operations of the old OSHA um, and, and so this is 
a kind of like a natural progression for that. And there's significant support for this MOU within uh, ADPHC. Um, what we look, what we've committed the institute to doing, is supporting um, any of the the conferences, any events that Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre put on. So if you are aware of any if we can have representation locally if you go along and say that you are there representing the institute that would be really really helpful for us um, we want to be um, front and centre uh, to make everybody aware that, that we have this relationship um, and I'm going to be um, uh, I've got some other news to it to probably to, if you haven't already known uh, yesterday we had our AGM uh, and we had one or two uh, people from Abu Dhabi on that on that um, on that call um, we announced the uh, our new president which is uh, actually a co-presidency um, it's, it's it's actually um, Ruth Denyer who is um, who works for Netflix um, and we've also got um, uh, Callum Irvin, who is a uh, global um, head of safety and security for International Hotel Group as well. So, um, so we've got two really, really um, good new presidents uh, that will be representing us over the next two years. Um, it'll be my intention to bring one or two of them out to, to Abu Dhabi next year. I've just returned from um, Saudi Arabia. I uh, had a, a very quick visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, and that that visit was really positively received. Um, and uh, we've got um, a, a range of uh, training courses now that we're looking to launch through our um, our um, learning provider network. Um, uh, that that we hope will be a real advantage to members in um, in Abu Dhabi and and the wider UAE as well. Um, so there's uh, some really exciting times for that. Again, with the uh, with the agreement with uh, ADPHC, we will try and promote the um, RSM membership to them. Um, because we've got the agreement and and it comes from the top, um, it it recognises membership of RSM more effectively than than it would have done in the past. Um, so I think there's a there's a real uh, positive step forward for the institute there. So um, I'm more than happy um, to uh, to really to, to present that to you as a as a as a as a real um, step forward for um, for you all in the region, um, and and I'm I'm really excited that um, we can build on this over over the next next couple of years. The agreement is for three years, um, and but we would I, I don't envisage us not being able to renew that going forward either. So this is a long term relationship that we're building with a with a major regulator within uh, within the within um, Abu Dhabi. So um, that's what I, I'm looking to you. We'll say if there's any other organisations you feel that we should be approaching, that we should be signing agreements with, please let me know. Um, education establishments especially um, are, are, are really key because we want to develop our, our wider qualifications with, with, with universities as well. Um, another thing I, I probably would like to announce today to you um, is that we've um, completed our, our final um, signing ceremony with um, Nibosh uh, for the full launch of our, uh, our certificate in um, risk management. Uh, and we, look, we hope to launch that globally from the 11th of January. Um, it's been it's an online course. Um, it's a qualification, and we've also greenlit the development of a diploma level um, qualification as well. So they'll be they'll be delivered by Nibosh and through Nibosh's learning partner network. Um, but we've got significant interest in that already, uh, and and we as I say we we hope to build on that further with a diploma, and then if we can have those relationships with the university from um, from our our members in um in the uae um we we would look to to develop a postgraduate qualification ultimately this is all aligned to our competency framework as well so it's it's linked to our new routes to membership uh, which again we launched in october um we're opening our doors to a much wider group of people so it's not pure health and safety people anymore um you are the core of our membership and always probably will be so we'll make sure that we are our, our services are geared towards you but what we want to do is try and uh, enable you to to be able to influence a much wider group of people so by encouraging them to join us 
um, we think we can make much more of a difference into, um, throughout organisations from, from the top to the bottom. So, you know, it, this is this is all uh, very new stuff for us. Um, we're really excited by it. We're excited by the relationship with Nibosh, um, and um, and and hopefully um, we'll get your support for um, for, for really um, bringing home uh, the benefits of of the relationship that we've developed with the Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre. Okay, I'm happy to take some questions if you have any. Um, and uh, but if not, I'm more than happy to come again. Join, join, and maybe I can come along for the 101st branch meeting as well. So this is a great, a great milestone for us, um, and I'm be delighted to, to to be here for the 100th as well. So thank you so much, and we can't do it without you, our members, and and the great um, committee that you've got currently led by Peter. Um, but it's um, you know you, you all. We really value your membership and the value the the volunteer aspect of 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 working with us in 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 the United Arab Emirates. Okay, so I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody's got any questions at the moment, I can stay around for a few minutes and and, and answer them if, if if you've got any burning issues. Well, thank you for those words, Philip, and thank you for providing that that update on the on the MOU and the uh, the changes following the AGM. Uh, Donna, do we have any any questions for Philip whilst he's here? Um, there's no no questions just yet. Okay. Okay. Fine. Well, in that case, Philip, I'll let you get back. I know you're very busy okay. today, and uh, thank you again for for dropping in. And uh, yeah, perhaps we'll see you in uh, in the hundred first meeting or or one of the future meetings in the new year. Whenever you want. And and as I say, I, we we will be coming to 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 um to the UAE um next year. Um, and uh, and I'll be delighted to meet you all in person as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you all do. So thank you. Take care. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. <clears throat> okay. Uh, can I just check, Donna? Is my screen still on display? Yes, it is, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I shall proceed. Okay, so some more branch news then. Um, the the new LinkedIn page continues to gather momentum. We're now over a thousand followers. Um, I'd recommend anybody who's not here to to look it up and and follow. And those of you who are following, if you can um, invite your followers to follow the page, then that will help us to push up the uh, the number of followers. Um, so it's been a great effort over the last three, four months to um, to get so much momentum um, with that page. Um, so let's build on that and get some critical mass so it can really become um, a beacon on LinkedIn for uh, the Middle East region for, for safety and risk practitioners. Um, some rather disappointing news. We have decided to cancel the site visit. Um, th there was limited interest, and I do apologize to those members who did express an interest in, in attending the site visit. Um, but I think, unfortunately, due to um, the current climate with regards to controls and, and COVID, um, that um, uh, I think people have perhaps been a bit reluctant to um, to commit to that. So we have cancelled the site visit. We will re-examine um, the activities that we're we're doing in the new year, and obviously, with scrutiny uh, dependent on. Um, on what the controls are with regards to, to COVID-19. Um, we're obviously all keeping an eye on, on the situation as it develops and as it's as the pandemic um, continues. Um, but we will be keep, we will be looking at um, what we have on the agenda for the new year moving through 2022 um, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, provide some some new and exciting events for you. With events in mind there are some upcoming branch meetings for you to make note of if you wish to attend. Um, there'll be one in the India branch on the 10th. The Egypt branch will be holding theirs on the 14th and the Qatar branch are holding theirs on the 21st of December. And there's also a London uh, branch meeting on the 13th of December um, uh, in the UK network. There are other meetings slated for the new year but I've only included those in December uh, uh, currently. 
and as Donna mentioned, um, the uh, the record this this meeting is being recorded, and it will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can also access the link to the previous branch meetings um, through the RSM website as well. Um, just to update on the um, professional development events that are, are forthcoming in December and January. Um, I had previously listed all of the events that were on the website, but I've now decided to pare it down to the uh, the ones coming up in the next couple of months, because I think there's about 13 or 14 um, additional events to the ones that I've listed here. Uh, but there's some really good content now that, um, that IRSM are, are developing and, and um, disseminating for you, um, really get into the core of um, risk and safety management in terms of business, in terms of theory and practice. Um, so there's some great examples and great um, content there for you to um, to uh, be part of. And I'd highly recommend that you uh, you do attend, you do make the time to attend these because aside from anything else, it's very good professional development. In terms of what we have planned uh, for the uh, future, we'll be joined by Samantha Ellaby from Clyde & Co uh, next month, next year, who will be uh, touching on uh, aspects of um, the legal implications of health and safety in terms of incidents in the workplace. Uh, she does a very good do's and don'ts presentation as well. so it's to really touch on uh, where your responsibilities lie and where your liabilities lie in terms of uh, if there's an accident on site. We'll be uh, hosting a special on safety in the heat in February uh, as we start to look towards the, the warmer months. I know it seems a long way away now, but it soon comes around, doesn't it? Um, but the serious point is that we should be planning for um, the hot weather uh, early in the year rather than uh, towards uh, May and June when, when it's already already hot. And then in March we're going to have a uh, focus on the branch itself, uh, principally for the, uh, the committee members and I'll be twisting some of the committee members arms to, um, to give a, a five or ten minute presentation on who they are but also more importantly what their roles and functions within the committee are. Um, and one of the reasons for this, obviously, is as we have the AGM on the horizon now, and we've got some elections coming up for some of the committee roles, uh, I think it would be useful for you to get more of an understanding of what's involved on the committee, um, uh, the type of skills and um, personality that's that's required, uh, so that you can have a can, you can have a think about whether it's something that you'd be interested in doing. Today, as we say, is the hundredth branch meeting, and We've only managed to get this far because we've had that service and dedication um, from um, willing volunteers within the community, and we'd like to see that continue. Um, I'm sure that members of the committee would be more than willing to put themselves forward again, but it would be nice to have some new faces and some new blood and some new eyes um, on the work that we're doing here to help to drive it forward and perhaps to diversify and, and bring new ideas to the table. We have. At the moment, uh, a blank slot in April. There's nothing slated yet. Um, so that's your opportunity as well. If anybody would like to uh, put themselves forward for a presentation, be it a, a 10 minute or a five minute presentation or a longer, more detailed presentation on any particular aspects of, of your work or your work experience or perhaps a field of expertise that you have in risk, risk and safety management, we'd be more than willing to give you the platform uh, to deliver a presentation. Alternatively, if anybody knows of um, uh, somebody who would be uh, a suitable uh, person to provide uh, a presentation for us on, on risk or safety topics, then please let me know or let one of the branch committee know and we can make the arrangements uh, for them to be, uh, to be part of the branch meeting. Um, and then in May, we've got the AGM and the branch elections as well. And we'll probably have some uh, uh, some uh, safety presentation there as well. OK, but that's something to focus on as we go forward. I think I might have mentioned this in the, in the November meeting, but we are also now going to start looking beyond 
the May uh, branch meetings, perhaps get a couple of things scheduled for June and July, or perhaps penciled in as, as potential presenters uh, beyond the AGM. So at least if there is a new committee or there are new committee members coming in, they're not uh, starting from scratch and um, uh, needing to solve some problems straight away. So we'd like to have that continu continuity and, and get a few things planned uh, beyond May as well. So again, if anybody's willing or if anybody knows anybody who would be um, a suitable person to present uh, after May, then please let us know. Okay, so that's enough talking from me. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Merrison, who, as I said, is uh, the group, uh, sorry, group head of, of HSE with Darwish bin Ahmed. And he's going to present on the importance of temporary works controls in construction risk management. So very much on topic for a lot of our membership today. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Now I'm going to try and share my screen. I do apologise, I'm a bit of a, a technophobe. So, um, can everybody see that screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm just going to try and put it into presentation mode without showing my notes. Otherwise, you may have to read my notes as well. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you can see my notes there. We can see, yes, we can see the, the notes format. Yeah. Are, are you all right to uh, proceed in that manner? You can or, carry on in that manner, or if you if you think you can, if you want to quickly try to um, to change the, yeah. the display, you can. Yeah, let me just take a quick look and see if I can remember what Donna showed me what to do. If you just go up to the top where it says display settings. Yeah. That's it. Drop down again. Drop yeah. presenter view and slide. Yeah, perfect. Right, Brilliant. okay. Thank you. Yeah, spot on, Andrew. Off you go. Right, okay. Um, good evening or good afternoon to uh, our attendees. Um, yeah, I'll just thank you for the introduction, Peter. I'm the group out of HSC for Dow's Benaro, a group of companies in uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, my background, very, very briefly. Um, I've got 35 years construction experience in UK, uh, Qatar and UAE. I've been over in GCC now for nearly nine years. Um, so previously project manager, so a construction background. Um, 2000, I started on the NEBOSH uh, uh, IGC route, then did diploma, uh, environmental diploma, and, uh, and then honours degree in health, safety and environmental management back in the UK. So that's my background. So construction is my uh, is my forte, although the group of companies now is very, very diverse. I deal with Peter um, in the industrial sector on uh, in a, a steel work fabrication um, business. Uh, many uh, around um, all of the Emirates, quarries in Fujira and uh, transport in Dubai. So very, very varied, but uh, construction is my my forte. So we're going to move on and um, talk a little bit today about the importance of uh, temporary works controls and construction risk management. Um, a very dramatic uh, opening graphic there. Um, that's temporary works gone wrong. So um, it's one of the high risk activities within construction, which uh, if not controlled from the outset is uh, a major, major uh, concern. So going through the agenda, um, I know very much like the members, uh, certainly through the WhatsApp groups, um, like some definitions and some references to legislation. Um, we're gonna look at some different types of temporary works, good and bad examples, and how we're gonna control it. Uh, the duty holders, procedures, uh, competencies, and then we're going to have a quick look at some uh, reference sources and best practices. And then, uh, if required, we'll take some Q&A uh, towards the end. Okay, so we're going to look at the definition of temporary works. To those who are not in the construction industry, it sounds a bit of a strange uh, title. Um, but this is the definition taken out of the, uh, the, the British Standard Code of Practice for temporary works. Um, so it's an engineering solution that is used to support or protect either an existing structure 
or the permanent works during the construction process or to support an item of plant or equipment or the vertical sides or side slopes of an excavation or to provide access. Now that's a real mouthful, I, I appreciate that, um, but we'll, we'll put a little bit of uh, meat on the bones and explain that in a little bit more detail uh, coming up. Right, so legislation. Um, what legislation do we have in place here in uh, the Emirates and Abu Dhabi specifically, which makes reference to this particular topic? So within the uh, Abu Dhabi Public Health uh, Centre framework, as we know formally OSHAD, we can, we can pick out a number of references. So obviously element two, uh, risk management, we need to manage the risk involved in this particular uh, uh, um, construction operation. Code of Practice 20, Safety in Design, Construction specifically, looks at these. So Section 3.1A36, uh, Temporary Works Engineers, including those designing auxiliary structures such as formwork, false work, facade retention, scaffold and sheet piling. All temporary work, so we've got a, we've got a reference there to the designers um, in this process. Uh, COP26, scaffolding. Uh, COP29, excavation works. COP40, false works, bracket, form work. I'll explain the basic differences between false work and form work as we, as we go through a few slides. Uh, COP43, um, temporary structures. Um, COP53, management uh, during construction works. And 53.1, specifically uh, the OHS construction management plan. Section 5.34 specifically looks at temporary works uh, being designed, checked, physical works inspected, and checked inspections recorded and demonstrated uh, and referred to designers and checkers. So we've got a lot of cross references and checks and uh, um, in guidance there within the, the uh, Abu Dhabi Public Health Centre framework. A uh, quick look uh, in Dubai Municipality Code of Construction Safety Practice, not as detailed uh, or as in depth as uh, ADPHC. Uh, there we go a reference in uh, on page 10, which is a reference to false work. Again, this is repeating the, the means of temporary structure use to support a permanent structure, as uh, the previous definition. Uh, the go to international legislation, uh, which I always fall back on. Obviously, you're probably aware uh, I'm from the UK, and um, I would go to the Construction Design and Management Regulations 2015 of the UK. Um, now, I do know that the Abu Dhabi uh, uh, codes of practice and uh, uh, working procedures uh, are based largely around uh, this particular piece of legislation. Um, and I put a reference in there to their guidance and regulations. It's available free online from the, uh, the UK Health and Safety Executive website. So that, there's a free download and that's a full uh, explanation guidance to the CDM regulations in the UK. So that's a, a, a quick look at the, um, the legislation required. Now, the types of temporary works. Um, as per a normal risk rating, we have uh, low, medium and high. So what I've done here, I've just made the, the, uh, the low green, medium amber and the high uh, in, uh, in red. Okay, so, and we deal with them as we would do with the, the normal risk ratings. Uh, the, uh, the, the higher the risk rating, the greater degree of potential um, the, um, uh, impl implications and the greater the uh, control measures are, are gonna be required. Okay, so I've also highlighted there in, in amber and red, a few of the areas we're gonna take a quick look at for, for reference. The, the green is very, very basic, um, can normally be done in-house by uh, competent persons. Uh, when we move on to the amber and to the red, then we're looking at more uh, skills, calculations, checks, and, and so on. But we'll, we'll look at the controls um, coming up shortly. Okay, so um, some real life examples. So that shadow there is me taking a photograph of some hoardings. From the previous slide, um, the hoardings up to three meters high um, fell into the, uh, the amber risk category. And there's an example of uh, one of my company's projects uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. That's a good example. Um, on the outside, 
um, it's a perimeter hoarding. Um, this actually goes approximately 15 kilometers around the uh, around the site. It's a huge infrastructure uh, development project um, just on the outskirts of Abu Dhabi. Um, so that provides security, dust control, noise control, and visual protection from the construction works. Uh, because as we'll see very shortly, I'll turn 90 degrees and uh, we're riding right to a residential development. So what's so special about that? Why, why does that need uh, designing and, uh, and, and controlling? Well, if you look on the back side, we can see the concrete anchor blocks designed and installed with stand extreme wind loadings. Um, nicely designed concrete blocks, very, very heavy duty, nicely fabricated um, steel structure there, keeping it all down uh, and, and, and secure. We're, we're in the uh, a desert type area there, very, very high winds at, at times. Uh, so it needs to be substantial enough uh, designed, calculated, checked to make sure that that is going to stay in place for its duration. So as I said, if we turn at 90 degrees and look 30 meters on the opposite side of the road, that's exactly what we see. So uh, <laughs> um, in a residential area, what does that tell me? It tells me it's not been designed, it's built with poor materials, it's badly erected, it's not been inspected, it's not been maintained. Massive, massive hazards, and that's, and that's a public highway, uh, as you can see, it's right next to. So uh, an example of how it should be done, and uh, unfortunately, all too commonly, how it uh, shouldn't be done. So um, that's a very basic, that's, that's site hoardings and fencing. Um, again, you won't have that just on construction sites, you'll have that during events, uh, you'll have it during, uh, on any um, area where you're demarcating from, from the public or from uh, unwanted um, access. Okay, a few more examples now. So um, in the list, we looked at facade retention structures, not so typical over here. Uh, that tends to be to protect uh, historically sensitive faces of buildings in both these examples here. Um, the internal structure has been demolished uh, for, for reconstruction, redevelopment, um, but they're in sensitive areas. So the, um, the visual uh, aspect of the building must be maintained to meet planning criteria. So again, two different types there of facade retention structures. Um, I'm gonna go on to now, this is a previous project in Qatar. That, that is a, um, a, a reinforcement cage structure prior to concrete for a, um, for a highway bridge. So as you can see there, um, there, that's just an access scaffold. That's not a structural scaffold there. Um, you can see the, very, very uh, faint lines just are, uh, go into concrete blocks. So that's an access scaffold, um, which will be removed prior to concreting. And literally just a few days later, um, that's what happened. We had a, a storm gale overnight and um, the whole structure blew over. Fortunately, it was the night shift, uh, there was no injuries, but that's the, the scaffold team put in supporting to make the structure safe. Um, and again, that's classed as one of the temporary works, if you remember from the previous um, structure. Here is a little informative video on the secant piled wall and strutting support system. Anybody who's in construction, over here in the UAE will know this particular method for um, excavating uh, down into basement levels. So hopefully this will play. Well, as you can see there, a ring wall of concrete piles has been installed and they're excavating. So during excavations, they're installing these tubes. So what tubes do is they support the external walls from the um, from the ground pressure again it's a very very good example of uh, <laughs> how it should be done correctly so as the excavation proceeds the steel tubes are, are installed um, they're only there on a temporary measure until the, the concrete floors the permanent floors are, are 
installed. Okay, very simply. So this is actually one of my projects again, or one of my country's projects. This is in Abu Dhabi uh, city on island. Uh, um, so we're 17 meters deep, we're below the water table, so we're pumping out. Um, and that's our steel tube props um, spanning side to side. Uh, again, we've got water table, um, we've got huge pressures forcing the outside. Where those props are now, um, they will be replaced by concrete floors, with four levels of uh, underground basement car parking, which will uh, provide or replace those, those structures. Also, you can just see uh, towards the middle is the mass for uh, a tower crane. So again, tower crane foundations is classed as a temporary, uh, temporary structure that needs designing, calculating to take all of the, uh, uh, the loads that the crane is going to um, be subjected to. Okay. Now, this next sequence, for those in Dubai or have been in the, the UAE for a long time, may find this one familiar. This is actually in Dubai, 2007, very, very famous uh, uh, illustration. So again, uh, we've got secant pile wall there, um, and we've got a lot of internal propping and strutting. Just in the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see um, we're below the water table. Uh, we're, we're, we're pumping groundwater out. And the next one, the disaster is starting. So this is this is a failure of the top section of the, uh, uh, of, of the structure. So that's either the structure itself not strong enough or insufficient propping to prevent the water pressure from forcing um, access into the, uh, into the excavation. And that's the final outcome. So that's the jib of the crawler crane uh, just poking up with the water. So from a risk perspective, um, those who have been trained in, in, in NEBOSH, we know the implications of a, of a major disaster. Um, I'm not actually sure about any casualties in this particular incident, but obviously that's, that's, that's a major risk. You've got a significant loss of reputation. You've got loss of um, product uh, um, or, or, or project uh, progress. Uh, major, major costs in uh, rectifying that pumping out, starting again, delays in the project, liquidated damages, uh, insurance premiums, everything that we've been told to were uh, you know, to factor in as negative uh, impacts of an incident is going to be <laughs> a consequence of this particular scenario. Okay, now one last video here on this particular uh, element of. Uh, um, temporary works again um, you can't hear this but again similar sort of scenario we've got um, we've got the the reinforced wall there which is retaining the structure behind uh, we can start to see soil moving at the bottom there there's lots of pins and plates on on, on that wall and again the tubes um, at a higher level there again you can start to see Right here, that's one of the props disappearing. Now you'll start to see the plates popping off. Now it, it's obvious to mention the guy standing at the side of the excavation and there are uh, no uh, demarcation barriers. But if you watch now, you see the real impact. So this is probably one of the most extreme examples that I've come across of uh, temporary works failure. If you look up there, we've uh, we've now got a, a block of flats which is overhanging the excavation, a water main which has been ruptured, and there uh, and, and people starting to run around panicking, scratching their heads, and they're uh, um, wondering what's going on. So. That, as you can see, is some of the significant consequences um, of getting it wrong. So how do we control that? Um, we have a code of practice for temporary works procedures. 
uh, and the permissible stress design and false work. So this is uh, pretty standard uh, 5975, recently uh, reviewed, updated in 2019. Very, very comprehensive document. Um, a lot of it is, is aimed at the structural engineers and how they design and calculate the particular uh, elements. Uh, now, I'm, um, from, a, from a health and safety practitioner perspective, we're more interested in the procedures um, and the, the duty holders and making sure that uh, the controls are in place. Uh, um, I wouldn't expect specifically the, the health and safety representative or, or the practitioner involved in the project to be able to undertake all these, but they should be aware of, uh, of what's in place uh, from a procedural point of view to ensure that um, all the duty holders are in place um, and the procedures uh, are being um, adhered to. So what the code of practice um, highlights is key personnel. Uh, a new change to the, uh, to the code of practice is the, the designated individual. Uh, we'll, we'll come on to the, uh, the actual roles and responsibilities on the next uh, few slides. Um, the permanent works designer, the temporary works designer, temporary works coordinator, temporary works supervisor, and the temporary works inspector. So they're the six key duty holders um, within the uh, particular procedure. Okay, so I'm not going to go through them in, in, in great detail, but the designated individual is, is, is the man at the top. He's the management or senior entity person responsible for ensuring that the procedure is in place. Um, so um, from the, uh, the British standard, uh, the procedure should be in place to be able to manage and deal with uh, the level of the degree of risk that the uh, particular uh, project or temporary works um, is involved in that particular scheme. Uh, the temporary works coordinator is a, is a role that's always been there. Um, he is um, designated to, to ensure that all the temporary works on the project are identified, um, uh, documented, uh, designed, checked, directed and inspected by appropriate personnel. Okay, the temporary works supervisor is the guy on site who will actually ensure that uh, the physical uh, works and controls and um, uh, infrastructure is put in place as per the design drawings uh, by competent uh, personnel. Temporary Works Inspector, is, as it says, is the, the guy who inspects um, the actual finished um, articles as it's been erected and as it's been uh, um, loaded during the, uh, the construction works. Um, and then we have the designer. The temporary works designer is the designer who, um, who looks after or the, the, me the methodology of, uh, of how the structure is going to be built. The permanent work designer will design what the finished article is going to be. He will work in conjunction with the temporary work designer to ensure that it's buildable, basically, and built in a safe, in, in a safe manner. OK, so they're the duty holders. Um, and on a project, uh, all the, uh, the temporary works should be uh, identified and recorded on a register. So the typical register. So, um, so these are some of the items that should be included. Um, reference, dates, risk classification. Is it high, medium, low risk? Who are the designers? Who are the design checkers? Uh, design check category. Uh, design checks completed. Is it erected in accordance with the plans um, and any dates to remove it? Okay, so the, the register will be backed up by lots and lots of paperwork, tick boxes, checklists, and uh, the design checks. Um, now, when we talk about the design checks, um, the more complicated the structure would generally go to independent third party uh, checkers. In, certainly in, in, in Abu Dhabi, the third party check will need to be registered with, uh, with the municipality as uh, approved engineers. Um, and so that's generally the, uh, the, the third party control check, uh, just as far as that's concerned. Okay, so um, controls, competence of the duty holders and, and knowledge of the procedures. So 
as safety practitioners, practitioners we're, uh, we're all very, very well aware that our, uh, our competence comes down to skills, knowledge, training, experience with similar or comparable uh, systems or, uh, or work methodology. Um, as I mentioned, the main uh, designers will almost certainly be approved engineers um, from a civil engineering or a structural engineering background. So as I say, it, it's not the responsibility of the safety practitioner to ensure or do any, any design checking. Um, that's, that's down to the experts, uh, structural engineers. Okay. Um, but when we look at the um, temporary works coordinator is, is my old certificate, which I did back in the UK quite a while ago now. So, um, so I was trained as a, as a temporary works coordinator. So I understand the procedure and what needs to be done, what needs to be in place, what needs to be checked. Uh, so I'm not a designer. I don't, I don't do the structural calculations. So that's the, uh, and that's a one foot. That was one full day course. So this little awareness session that we're doing now for 30 minutes or 35 minutes, uh, it will not make you a, a temporary works coordinator. It will just give you a little bit of knowledge to go and seek some more information um, and a little bit more guidance uh, moving forward. Okay. So, but these, these courses are available. The general, general awareness courses are available. Um, so back to uh, the British standard code of practice. So what should be in place? So as a safety practitioner, what should you be looking for on a project um, to, to ensure that the system is being implemented? So there should be a procedure, so a written procedure um, which incorporates the requirements of this particular uh, British standard. Okay, so that should uh, identify and classify the type of structure that is going to be checked. All persons should be officially appointed. So the, the designated individual, the temporary works coordinator, the temporary works inspector, temporary works supervisor, they should all be appointed in letter, in writing, okay, with their roles and responsibilities. They will sign that to say they are, are um, uh, they understand their duties. Part of that will be the competency checking of these key personnel. There will be a temporary work register, which we've touched on. Um, there will be temporary works erection and inspection checklists, very similar to the scaff tag situation that you would have for, for basic scaffolding, but much, much more uh, in, in depth and intricate. Okay, so periodic inspection checklists, i.e. seven day inspection or after any other, um, adverse weather conditions or any changes. Uh, now, a critical one for um, temporary works is the permit to load certificate. Now, this is usually for in situ concrete pours. So, the temporary works supervisor and inspector will sign off the scaffold to say and sign a form to say this is now complete and is in a condition which can receive uh, concrete or additional loading. Now, if you bear in mind that concrete, wet concrete weighs 2.7 tonnes per cubic metre, and it's not uncommon to have 1,000 cubic metre concrete pours on big structures in, in this part of the world on mega projects, you're talking best part of 3,000 tonnes of wet concrete. And until it sets, it's, it's just water. So it's a very, very heavy weight uh, and unpredictable. Okay, so that's a very, very important document permit to pour. Um, once the concrete uh, or the structures are in and complete, then another qualified person must issue a permit to strike or remove the temporary work. So two very, very key documents there, permit to pour, permit to strike. We'll have a quick look at uh, uh, some complex structures. Again, this is, this is uh, a project of mine from Qatar. That's a, 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 rel, a, sorry, a road viaduct. So there's, uh, there's 12 lanes on top of that. Um, now, the definition of false work and form work. Um, the form work is contained at the top there uh, between the, the yellow axis. If you think of form work, it's like a jelly mold or a, or a, a bread tin. That's what forms the shape of the, uh, of the concrete. So form work forms the shape. That's, that's where the, the concrete goes in and, and makes the shape of the, the road bridge. The false work, is all the scaffolding underneath, which holds up and supports the, um, the formwork. 
in very, very simple terms. Okay, just to sort of uh, put a little bit of clarity on, on the terminology. Now, on this very bridge, uh, we can, I, I can demonstrate a high potential near miss, um, which because of the uh, integrity and the professionalism of the temporary works inspector, it highlighted a more fundamental problem. So, um, post dress cast in situ concrete on the highway bridge, as I, as I mentioned, as the concrete pour started, so everything's installed exactly as per designer, as exactly as per um, the, uh, the shop drawings, the working drawings. Okay, so half the concrete's being poured. This is about 600 cubic meter, so nearly 2,000 tons of concrete. Uh, um, so as the concrete's being poured, the temporary works inspect underneath, they're making sure everything's still in place. Uh, they spotted that one of the upright standards or two of the upright standards are starting to bow. So that raises the alarm immediately. Um, these are 12 meters high and there's a, there's a boat, which is indicating that there's some excessive loading coming down on through the, uh, through the uh, standards there to the ground. The alarm was raised, the concrete pour was stopped immediately. There was 250 people stood on top of that, working, uh, placing concrete and uh, preparing new areas. Um, so that was stopped and everybody was cleared and made safe. So that cost a fortune to clear, clean, uh, but a potential disaster was, uh, was, was averted. Now, I investigated this, um, very, very complicated design calculations, and it was actually proven that there was a misprint in the manufacturer's uh, technical manual, which gave a, an incorrect uh, loading uh, capacity. Um, so, disaster averted by a competent and professional temporary works inspector. Okay, so and that was high potential near miss uh, averted. Um, and that's what could happen. On the left hand side, this was earlier this year, so this was an uh, unfortunate fatality of five workers in Belgium, or Western Europe, of uh, temporary works failure during a school construction. And uh, on the right there, uh, was a temporary works failure of a, a bridge in Manchester, UK, uh, going back uh, quite a few years. So when it goes wrong, it goes uh, very, very badly. Okay, so I'll give you a reference here to um, some excellent um, uh, reading or research. Uh, the Temporary Works Forum is, is a UK organisation. They promote the best practice in the construction industry. Um, take a note of that, that website. They have a vast array of free online guidance PDF downloads. And uh, just going on to the next one there, um, these are two. If you look at the one on the right, titled Temporary Condition and Reinforcement Cages Prior to Concreting, uh, that's exactly the same guidance to the one that I referred to earlier, where the, the, uh, the reinforcing cage uh, blew down. Uh, overnight. That's 70 or 80 pages. Again, um, I've highlighted their free downloads because it's a little bit unclear on the, on, on the PDF screenshot there. But I certainly recommend going to the, the Temporary Works Forum uh, as, as a best practice reference there, uh, free downloads. Again, one there, Effective Management of Scaffolding, all to BS5975. You'll find a lot of information on there. Um, and that is uh, my recommendation uh, for, for further reading. Okay, so um, that uh, as far um, is, is a brief overview of, of, of temporary works in a very, very quick um, uh, time scale, um, just to raise your awareness uh, to do a bit more research and say the references are there. Uh, so we've looked at um, legislation, the, the, the types and categorization, the, the relevant uh, British standard uh, guidance, some basic competency, uh, some basic types of uh, uh, temporary works, uh, roles and responsibilities, and uh, as I say, a very, very quick whistle-stop tour of, uh, of temporary work, which as you can probably appreciate, very, very high risk and um, very, very relevant to the, uh, to the health and safety uh, profession, certainly in construction. Um, 
also uh, relevant to other other industries also okay so that's uh, uh, that, that's everything i uh, would like to share with you at this particular time um, so if there are any questions by all means or, uh, uh, let us know and we'll see if we can come up with some answers <clears throat> thank you excellent andrew really good stuff there really interesting very informative um great examples both here and, and abroad um and some good reference material for uh, for those who for whom it's relevant which should be hopefully most of us um uh, donna do we have any questions for, for andrew uh, there's no questions come through yet okay okay uh, well i will just again thank you andrew for for the presentation and for your time this evening um perhaps if if questions do come forward um donna can forward them on to me and, and i can forward them on to you um and we can perhaps pop them up, up on the whatsapp group um andrew's very active on the whatsapp group uh, uh, along with certain members so um he's there if, if anybody's got any questions about today's presentation so once again andrew thank you very much for your time and for your presentation that's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and the, the opportunity to, uh, to to share some information. It's good to have you with us. <clears throat> OK, so if I can have uh, the screen back, I can finish off. Yeah, we have just got. Um, oh, is there one come through? Yeah, we have just got uh, a question come through. Are you still there, um, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> Right, so it says uh, unloaded scaffolds under TG20. Do you class them as TW? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you, you, uh, you, you, we need to look at them all in uh, all in isolation. Um, but uh, temp temporary works doesn't generally class general uh, access scaffold. It's just for uh, um, uh, access and working and, and working platforms. Um, but I would look at the um, the elements such as its location, how high, um, what particular activities are, are being undertaken. But no, not 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 generally uh, a general access scaffold um, specifically um, to un undergo a, a temporary works procedure. It may, it may undergo a, a scaffolding, a basic scaffolding design, but not necessarily the full blown. Um, a procedure which we've highlighted with designated individuals and uh, temporary works coordinators and, and so on. If, if it's a basic access couple, no, it should be okay. Brilliant. Very good. Okay. Any um, any more questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, one person's asking, they're saying that they don't understand why reinforcement reinforced steel that will eventually eventually be um, oh, sorry, it's just it's gone. Um, concerted is termed as concrete work. Concreted is termed as concrete work. So why is um, reinforced steel uh, that will, that will be concreted termed as concrete work? Well, until in, in, in the example that I showed, the the, the reinforced the, the reinforcing steel was in a temporary condition until such time as the, the permanent concrete was poured. So it's in an unstable condition until the, the concrete is poured uh, in, in the structuring and, and cured to its final uh, to its final strength. Um, if, if that's how I've understood the context of the question. Yes, I think so. Is the steel is part of the concrete works? It's the first part, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it is inherent. Inherently unstable until it's uh, concreted and, and, and finally uh, encapsulated, shall we say, by the uh, by the, uh, the strength of the concrete. Okay. Any more questions, Donna? Um, no, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, well, yep. Once again, Andrew, thank you very much for your time in the presentation. Um, pleasure. Okay. So if I can have uh, have control of the screen, I can wrap up for the final few slides. There you go, Peter. Lovely, thank you. So I'm sure you probably know these slides off by heart now. Um, but yes, any other business? There are uh, 
branch merchandise available um, if anybody is interested in in getting some. We did have some um, uh, interest following the last meeting. Uh, just drop me a WhatsApp uh, or send me an email and we'll arrange um, uh, a time and a place to make the exchange. Um, and again, our social media uh, and communications channels are, are all there for everybody to avail themselves of. Um, the WhatsApp group is obviously the most popular, um, but we're active on the, um, the IRSM Middle East Twitter. Um, we have um, our email and our YouTube channels. And of course, perhaps most importantly, we've got our new LinkedIn page and that's really starting to gather momentum, as I said earlier. So they're all there for you to make contact with us and to, um, uh, to engage uh, in the membership or with the membership. Um, and it's a great forum uh, and it's a great community. So that allows me to conclude the 100th branch meeting and to thank you all for your time and attendance. Uh, I take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a very happy new year. And given that I think many people might be traveling, um, we'll, we'll skip the first Wednesday of January and we'll look to meet on the second Wednesday of January next year, which will be the 12th. Um, and when we'll be joined by our representative from Clyde & Co. So I look forward to seeing you all then and wish you a very uh, safe and happy evening. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and congratulations on 100 events. <laughs> Thank you. They weren't all Thanks. me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank uh, you, Donna. Have a lovely evening, everyone, and we'll see you at the next event. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Take Andrew. care. Bye. Yes, bye-bye.